If my background is making you feel a little bit on edge because the cushions aren't quite as neat as usual and something is a little different, you can't quite put your finger on it. Um, I mean, I can only apologize, but my cat has decided to take a nap right here. You better be a good girl, sugar pie. Mama's gotta do her stories. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing really well. Most of the time on here these days, I'm doing some kind of weird dance routine, pulling out accents that I didn't even know were in my system trying on clothes and it's funny because even though i've kind of turned into a clothing shopping fashion type youtuber um i don't really care about clothes that much <laughs> yeah i'm not really that interested in fashion whatsoever the part of it that i do care about is trying to make you guys feel a little bit better a little bit more confident i like it when we have big heart to hearts about like insecurities and body confidence and all that kind of stuff that's what i'm in it to win it for however what i really like doing what I actually genuinely really care about is reading books. There is nothing I love more, come rain or shine, however crap or great I'm feeling, there is nothing I love more than grabbing a blanket, probably grabbing the cat, grabbing some snacks, grabbing whatever else I fancy grabbing and curling up with a new book. It is the best feeling in the world turning that new page. Um, and even though I haven't made one of these videos for a while, I've been reading. Oh yes, I've been reading. And it makes me really happy to remind myself that even though the fashion stuff is like the bread and butter these days, these book videos are always the thing that people still constantly ask for all the time and ask when the next one's gonna be. So a few of you might be pleased to see that today is that day. I'm back with another 10 books I've read recently. I've got quite a strange mixture of stuff here, so hopefully there'll be at least one thing that floats your boat that you can add to your to-read list. Sorry, Flo. I've got some that I loved. I've got, I mean, I've got one that I hated. Ooh, stay tuned. Drama. Tea. <laughs> Book tea. That's about as exciting as it gets around here, ladies and gents. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> it's about to get interesting. If you are one of the few who is not just here for me trying on 90 pairs of jeans in half an hour, then I would love it if you give this video a little thumbs up if you enjoy it. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you are new. I'm going to try and do a lot more of these. It's just finding the time to read, isn't it? In this crazy modern world, finding 20 minutes to sit down with a good book, it's a, it's a blessing. I've got a cup of coffee here and I can tell that it's already going cold and I haven't even started chatting about books yet. So better get on with it, haven't I? Okay, book number one. First up, we are gonna have a little chat about Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. Most of what I'm gonna chat about today, I've got hard copies of. I'm back into back into paperback. But this one I actually lent to a friend a couple months ago, so I'm gonna pop a picture here. Little Fires Everywhere is fiction. It is set in Shaker Heights, and I think we all know Shaker Heights. It's a modern little suburb. Everything is perfectly brand new and shiny and planned to perfection, and everyone who lives there is exactly the same. Eleanor Richardson is the ultimate Shaker High resident. She is all about playing by the rules, and she loves a little humble brag about her amazingly successful life. But then Mia moves in just around the corner with her teenage daughter Pearl and they are renting um, a spare place from the Richardsons. Mia and Pearl seem like the most loving, enigmatic, arty mother and daughter pair, um, but Pearl soon becomes inseparable with the Richardsons' kids. And of course, there's a little bit of teenage romance involved there, but Mia's past is a little bit mysterious and she gives approximately zero flying books about playing by the rules and following everybody else which doesn't go down too well in Shaker Heights. It doesn't take long before Eleanor gets suspicious of Mia and her whole history so she starts to delve into tracing the long-kept secrets of Mia's past. I really enjoyed this one. I was about to say I loved it but I don't think I did love it. I definitely really enjoyed it. It's generally a little bit of a slow mover rather than some kind of like fast paced thriller, but it's definitely really great. It's complex character portrayal of everyone involved in the whole story. It's so well built and structured around a lot of different characters that are all really well formed. I really liked the whole complexity of all the family dynamics working together. I fully related to that claustrophobic feel of like tense small town politics. But most of all, I've got to say, I was just engrossed by the characters themselves. They're so vivid and I really loved the writing. There's quite a lot of different stories all entwined together. So it's quite a rich story and it's got quite a lot of layers to it. 
ogres have layers. And because the characters are so well written, I always think this is a good sign of a good character. It's difficult to decide whether you actually trust any of them, whether you like any of them even. And just as a little side note, I love the title to this story. I think it's so perfectly apt for how the little intricacies of life really do kind of pop up like little fires and burn through relationships and day-to-day -day life. I think it's such a clever title. So yeah, solid four out of five for this one. Really enjoyed it. Um, I know a lot of people have hit, hit some heavy criticism in its direction, but I really enjoyed it. Okay, number two, The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. Stuart Turton, we need to talk. I really hoped I would never see this book ever again for as long as I live. But here we are, reunited. Uh. This book was my Everest, and when I closed that last page, I felt satisfaction and victory that <laughs> I haven't felt for a very long time. It was like reaching the end of an A-level paper. And when you're picking up a fiction book, I mean, comparing it to an A-level paper, it's not what you want, is it really? Like it actually became a running joke with Adam that every night when I picked this up, he'd be like, enjoy your book, lol. And I do not like to say that I did not enjoy a book because I have so much respect for authors. Sitting and writing a book is no mean feat. And who am I to criticize someone's work? I don't have a published book. Who am I to say? that this was nonsense. But here I am <laughs> about to tell you that I thought this was categorical nonsense. <laughs> this is like the very overblown fictional drama equivalent of Groundhog Day. So Lord and Lady Hardcastle have invited guests to their country mansion for a weekend party to celebrate the return of their daughter Evelyn. And one of the guests at the party, Dr. Sebastian Bell, wakes up suddenly and finds himself running through the forests in the grounds. And all he is aware of in his own head is the name Anna hanging on his lips. But he has no idea who Anna is or who he is himself. Then that night at the party, Evelyn Hardcastle is killed. And then the next day, this guy wakes up in another person's body, the butler. Then he wakes up again in another person's body, and again in another person's body. See where this is going? Unfortunately for this mystery bloke, Evelyn Hardcastle won't just die once. She will die every single night, and that day will repeat itself over and over with the same fateful end until the murder is solved. And the only way to break that cycle is to find the killer. Sounds pretty cool, right? Yeah, I thought so too when I picked this up. I love a mystery, I love a thriller, I love weird books that are a little bit different from the average fiction, but it is fair to say that I am definitely missing something here. I am definitely in the minority because it's been so highly praised. So don't let me stop you giving it a try, but I found the whole thing from beginning to end so convoluted that I just couldn't find any part of it that I actually cared about. Not a single character, not a single event, not a single plot development. I just did not care. I literally did not care about Evelyn <laughs> getting horribly murdered every night. Sorry, love. I thought the story dragged pretty heavily. And I also just couldn't get on board. I think this was one of the main things. I could not get on board with this author's style of writing. It's pretty grand and overblown just kind of for the sake of it. I guess it's to reflect like the o overblown nature of the party and the people in it. But oh God, it made it quite a dense read. Anyway. This was a slog and a half. Um, I would say it is a very impressive feat. It's a very complicated story and it must have taken so many mind maps and bits of string to piece it all together, but it was just not my cup of tea. Maybe I'm too stupid for it. But if I've taken anything from this, uh, it's definitely learning the lesson that don't buy books just because you like the red pages. Number three. I mean, I told you we were going for polar opposites. So <laughs> this is the classic Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding. I've never read this before. Your hero of mine, Bridget Jones, hey? Spirit animal of everyone who loves wearing big knickers and snacking and drinking wine. Cheers to that, my three favorite activities. Just in case by some miracle you haven't watched ITV2 in the last 10 years, uh, here we go. So Bridget Jones's Diary is the diary of Bridget Jones. <laughs> She's a smart one. And Bridget is a 30-something singleton 
living in London. There's not really a huge plot for me to explain really, it just kind of, in the nature of a diary, delves into her love life, relationships with her friends, her working atmosphere, um, it's very light-hearted and the entries, obviously because it's a diary, are very short. I don't want to be a downer, we'll get the bad stuff out of the way first with this one because there is some bad stuff. It's fair to say that this book <laughs> has not aged well in some aspects. It was published in 1999, I want to say. Um, I've never read it before. I remember my mum reading it when it first came out and I was quite young and she was like, Lucy, you are not allowed to pick up this book. Do not read this book. Um, so it took me 20 years to break my mum's rule. The first most like glaringly obvious thing about it, which quite struck me actually, there is a lot of chat about weight and losing weight, which just does not fly these days. And a lot of it is verging on like unfathomably ridiculous. She's constantly calling herself fat and using it like the old derogatory way as if it's like the single worst thing that a woman can be. And she lists her weight all the time and she's literally probably no bigger than a size 12. She literally weighs nine stone three at the beginning of the book where she's like, my new year's resolution is to lose half my body weight. So it's, it's questionable. For a lot of people that will make this book a complete no-no and that's fair enough. It is entirely ridiculous. And if you are triggered by weight discussion, it is certainly not for you. I would also say that Bridget in the book is not likeable in the way that Renee Zellweger makes her likeable in the films. And I was quite surprised by that because she's very lovable in the movies, but in this, she is so much more crass and shallow and self-obsessed and so completely self-loathing that <laughs> it was like watching one of my own videos. <laughs> yeah, just a very different character really. But, and it's a big but, it's a Bridget Jones size but, um, all that aside, once you get over the fact that it is the most 90s kind of problematic that you can possibly get, um, it's very enjoyable. <laughs> I literally laughed my ass off out loud reading this like multiple times. I love the way it's written in like proper diary style, love the way that Bridget is verging on intolerable but kind of in the way that your best mates can do your head in sometimes or how you can do your own head in sometimes. <laughs> when I was thinking about all the kind of like themes and topics and stuff, I think if I'd read this when I was any younger I probably wouldn't have connected with it in the same way that I did. But because because I'm not actually all that far away from my 30s and Bridget is trying to like navigate her 30s, I took quite a lot of comfort from it. Bridget is just trying to blindly do the whole growing up thing while trying to convince everybody that she knows what she's doing uh, and that is something I definitely relate to. She has no clue but she's trying to convince everyone that she really does. So I think basically you just have to take it for what it is. Like yes it is very silly, yes there is some discussion that definitely does not fly anymore and yes it is a little bit dated but bloody hell it is funny. And actually that just reminded me of the movie. And yes, I will always be just a little bit fat. Oh, an icon. I mean, we can all only aspire really, can't we? A true hero of the times. Number four, I think, is Sally Rooney, Conversations with Friends. Another chance for me to go off on one about how much I bloody love Sally Rooney and how I wish I was her and how I wish I was as talented as her. <laughs> I chatted about these next two books in my favourites video recently. Um, so if you've seen that, then you might want to skip forward a little bit. If you haven't seen that, that's rude. Go back and watch that one, please. So this one, the one with the yellow cover, um, is told from the perspective of Francis. Francis is 21. She's level-headed. She watches the world with a dark, like very fine-tuned gaze. She really kind of, she's got quite a cutting perspective of life. She's at college. She dreams of being a writer. Hey, don't we all? Um, and her and her best friend Bobby do spoken word poetry together. Bobby is her stunningly beautiful ex-girlfriend who makes people fall in love with her like that and she knows it. She's completely self-involved and she's one of those girls, we all know them, who considers herself very deep and meaningful and misunderstood um, but even so, she's still everything to Francis. Then one night during a poetry performance, the girls meet Melissa and Nick. Um, they get closer as time goes on and it's not long until things have turned into a very confusing, kind of seedy, obsessive love square, I guess. 
love squares, four of them, right? And as the story unfolds, Francis is trying to keep her life under control as this all, all this madness kind of goes on. Um, but she's struggling with her own mind and her own demons at the same time. And she has to kind of let, learn to let go of her like naturally very straight talking intellectual way of life and kind of just let life itself take the wheel for a bit and let it do all the painful, unpredictable things that it does. Love her writing so much. I think it is spot on. There seems to be a bit of a theme with my book choices right now, uh, cause this one doesn't really have a huge amount of plot to it either. Um, it's more about zoning in on the characters and their questionable decisions and their consciences around those decisions. All the classic like coming of age stuff, like a young woman trying to figure out who she really is when no one else is like taken into consideration in the picture when it's just her. And I really loved kind of thinking about how we all take on like kind of play like different roles to different people through, through our lives until we figure out who we are and we stop playing a role and we just be that same person for whoever we come into contact with. You might relate to her kind of like introvert nature and the way that she seems aloof, but she's actually studying everything around her with minute attention and really kind of analyzing every situation. And I just thought it explored all of those quite heavy things in a really realistic and almost still quite discreet way. It's very clever writing. Um, and I really related to it. I really, really enjoyed this one. I thought it was great. And then next up is Normal People, which is then the second of Sally Rooney's books. It's not a sequel and it's no exaggeration to say that I basically inhaled this book. <laughs> I devoured every single page from start to finish. Normal People starts out at high school with Connell and Marianne, who could not be more different as kids. Like he's popular, loads of mates, sporty, you know the soul. Uh, Marianne is, I mean, I mean, she's the rest of us at school. <laughs> Lonely, quiet, private, uh, but very proud and like not willing to reach out to anybody. But nevertheless, Connell and Marianne, uh, they find out that there's a connection between them. They just click for no reason other than fate really. Um, but they decide to keep their relationship completely under wraps still in a way that is quite painful to read actually as an adult. Later on in life, they meet again at university and what do you know, the roles have been reversed. So Marianne is suddenly the popular one while Connell is struggling to like figure things out and get his shit together. They go through uni kind of almost crossing paths, like touching journeys, circling each other very timidly with like a million different obstacles in the road but something always seems to pull them back together. It sounds almost a little bit cheesy and like very romantic when you say it that way, but it's normal people. Like it's not the romance that you might want it to be. If you're looking for a romantic read, this might not be it. God, honestly, even thinking about this book gives me like a dull ache within my heart. It feels like someone has punched me in the face with a load of feelings. I don't know how she does it. I wish I did know, but somehow this author writes literally the bare bones of what she needs to. Like as the title says, it's just a normal story about normal people, but it is just so perfectly and tenderly written to explore like the complexity of, I guess, imperfect relationships. There is such a fineness to imperfect relationships and somehow it gets it right. Honestly, the emotion of this is just so authentic. I basically found it impossible to not get swept away in it. And I like the put the sign of a great book is when you're sad to see the characters go, isn't it? And I genuinely felt sad. Heads up, I cried loads and um, most of the time, I didn't even know why I was crying because nothing particularly sad had happened, but it just really moved me. One of you guys sent me the link to this actually. Uh, the BBC have just picked it up for a TV show. So I can't wait for that to either be the best thing that's ever been made or <laughs> entirely ruin this book. Okay, next on the shelf was Uncommon Type by Tom Hanks. Did I just buy this collection of short stories because they're written by Tom Hanks and I absolutely love Tom Hanks. 
Um, absolutely I did. So this isn't really one that I can dive into a big plot outline for um, because it's literally 17 short stories um, but they all have one thing in common and that is that there is a typewriter subtly placed in each of the plots. Like it's barely noticeable sometimes but they do each have a typewriter in there somewhere which I thought was a really cool and a really cute little idea. I really like that and I really just like the feel of reading short stories. Like each of them felt like a really nice little mini window that allowed you to like almost get like a capturing glance of a different moment. A little glance into a different scenario, you just capture that moment and then you walk away. I just really like that. I would really like to say that it was brilliant. Um, in reality it was just quite good and I think it can be summed up by saying that it was really nice. For me the writing in this is like a little bit like weirdly old-fashioned. It does kind of read just like a man in his like 60s and it's just very pleasant. It is literally the book form of Tom Hanks <laughs> um, but it's still really readable. It's quirky, it's kind of charming, it's very sweet, warm, interesting and I like the kind of mixture of the stories as well. You literally never know what to expect when you start a fresh story and they're all really likeable, <laughs> really enjoyable just like he is. Maybe I would have enjoyed it even more if I'd listened to Tom Hanks telling them on the audiobook because he does the audiobook and then it would have been like Woody reading me a bedtime story every night so I think maybe that's where I went wrong with this one. Wee! This is a Lucy Wood book video so obviously here comes the thriller. Um, this is Close to Home by Cara Hunter, the top 10 bestseller. My last two book videos were pretty thriller heavy actually um, because literally the last couple of years they were all I read but this year I decided to try and be a little bit more general fiction focused. Just a little heads up, it's about a missing little girl so if that kind of thing is difficult for you or you don't like that then avoid this one, maybe skip ahead a little bit to the next book. Daisy, who's eight years old, goes missing from her family's fancy dress party and Detective Adam Forley is brought onto the case. And this is actually the first in a series of D.I. Adam Forley books, I think. Um, I haven't checked out the rest yet. I don't know if they even exist yet. Maybe I'll have to have a little look. Anyone who's read a thriller before knows that nine times out of 10, the offender is someone close to home. But funnily enough, Daisy's family are seriously strange. The mum is obsessed with like material things and keeping up appearances. The dad is really cold and defensive. The little brother's like a classic oddball. It's literally like she's disappeared into thin air. No one knows what's happened to her but everyone is a suspect. It's nothing majorly groundbreaking or challenging or beautifully written um, but it's a really addictive little read actually. Um, it's quite fast paced, the plot was intriguing and I would say it's like confusing and clever enough to really keep you guessing which just I suppose is all you want from a decent police story really isn't it? There really is twist after twist in this one actually thinking back on it and like it's one of those where just when all the big red arrows start pointing at someone and you think you've cracked it and you think you're in the wrong job uh, the story does a complete 180 and you've got no idea and you have to start all over again. The ending was cool though, the ending is really unexpected, maybe ever so slightly unrealistic but if you're alright with suspending your disbelief every now and again then I think you'll be pleased with it. I didn't come anywhere near to guessing it so <laughs> absolutely zero well done's to me with this one. I didn't love the writing, I felt like it was a little bit cheesy sometimes like it was trying a bit too hard to sound like a cockney kind of blokey policeman. I don't really know how to describe it but I didn't think it was like A plus quality writing. So if you're in it for like a twisty police story and you're not in it for any literary prizes then you're good to go. Number... I literally have no clue. The next one. I wasn't going to include this because it's actually a reread but obviously like it's pretty relevant to a lot of the content that I make on this channel. I think a lot of you could take something from this book. I recommend it to literally anyone I ever talk to about weight, food problems, body image problems um, and this book was a really huge factor in the turning point that I had with my own self-confidence and my own kind of like self-love journey. Um, this book was an important crux of that. So it made sense to include it even though I've read it before and I've talked about it before. Um, I think a lot of you guys would appreciate this. If you don't follow Megan who is the author of this one, um, if you don't follow her on Instagram then you really need to switch that up because she is a 
fantastic, lovable, gorgeous, inspiring force of nature. I'm speaking from experience myself, I can pretty much promise that she will positively impact your life for the better. I was actually lucky enough to work with Megan a couple months ago at a fashion event. Trust me, I was dying on the inside. Um, and it was honestly one of the best YouTube work days I have ever had because we got on so well. She is so fun and friendly and welcoming and just a total babe. You can't tell, I'm a major fangirl for Megan. Um, I rate everything she does and I think she's an absolute treasure. If you are wanting to change the way you think and feel about your body, but you are completely overwhelmed or intimidated by the whole like girls in bikinis on Instagram telling you to love yourself, then this is a very safe, lovely place to start. I think of this book as, it's kind of like the equivalent of a hug from a really comforting friend. And the way she writes this, it strikes a really good balance because it's strong and informative and really intelligent and passionate about important things. But at the same time, it's also really gentle and healing and funny and uplifting and basically all the good words that you can think of, chuck them in that mix. The book itself is a mixture of memoir, I guess, from Megan's own experiences with eating disorders and recovery. But then there's also a whole load of really kick-ass, like diet culture exposing, research in an accessible way, important history behind body positivity, and then just like a little sprinkling of self-help too, without being condescending. Basically, if you are tired of dieting, tired of hating your mirror, tired of not knowing how to open up to your friends about this kind of stuff, tired of spending your life trying to shrink yourself, treat yourself to this book. Read it little bit by little bit and take in the goodness. It will make you want to hug that insecure, self-loathing teenage girl that you used to be and it will make you want to tell her that she is enough. I just wish I had had this book and I had had Megan as an influence when I was that girl when I was 15 because genuinely I think my life would have been very different. That was quite an intense note to end on wasn't it? She's a real babe and it's also pink. There we go. Oh, oh, I'm excited to talk about this one. My favourite murder. Dun, 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 that sounds like James Bond, that's not what I'm going for. So this is Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered, the definitive how-to. It's quite a title if you've got no idea what the hell this is or where it's come from. Very simply, it is the memoir of two women, uh, Georgia Hardstock and Karen Kilgariff, who host a podcast called My Favourite Murder. You might have heard of it, it's pretty successful. Both of them are total true crime junkies and every episode they each tell a story, a different true crime story, but they, it's not as dark as it sounds. They are also both so freaking hilarious. And as well as telling like horrifying, gruesome murder tales, which are also really interesting and also done very respectfully. They also just chat a load of nonsense through the majority of the podcast. Oh, I wish I was them so bad, or I wish I was like best friends with them. It took me about 0.2 seconds to order their new book. I think it literally came out last week. Um, and I finished it in two sittings. And I kind of figured that it would just be a load of true crime stories, like nothing particularly groundbreaking, but actually it's not that at all. It's completely different. And this is Georgia and Karen's own stories. They share stories from their own lives and it ranges from everything from like heartbreaking family memories to like shockingly bad decisions to really relatable, honest mental health struggles. All of the stories are like super relatable, big life lessons that I think you would probably really enjoy reading if you, even if you'd never heard the podcast before. Like it's just like good 20s, 30s life chat. I just love these two women beyond reason. Um, I think they are such great like influences. Like I listen to them talk about their lives and things that they've been through and stuff. And I feel so uplifted and empowered pretty much every single episode, they talk about something that I am like, hell yes. I love their tone, I love their humour, I love that they are literally just unapologetically themselves. They have reached that point in life where they are just like, screw it, this is, this is who I am. Honestly, so many parts of this were super empowering to me. Um, I'm trying to have more like empowering female influence in the content I consume. I'm trying to get more of that because I think it's really good for you. And this has been 
a really big example of that. It honestly just made me feel like being a strong woman who trusts her own instincts is like the coolest thing in the world and it is and if a book can make you feel like that then surely it's gotta be worth reading. <laughs> so whether you're a fan of the podcast or not um, I would say just be ready to laugh like a weirdo in public and probably also cry a little bit. SSDGM. Okay, and last but not least, I know it says 10 books that I've read recently in the title, but I guess it's technically nine with one, which I'm just about to start reading. This is The Multi-Hyphen Method by Emma Gannon. It's generally aimed at, I think, people with like creative or digital interests or expertise or work or hobbies. The author, Emma Gannon, was a blogger, I wanna say, originally, but now she's written for like loads of different massive publications. She has a really successful podcast. She has a book before this one, I think. So she kind of, has a similar career to me but <laughs> way more successful and probably makes about 90 times more money than I do. At the risk of making this sound painfully eye-pokingly dull, um, I guess this would officially be classed as like a business book. Mm. <laughs> but this is a cool business book and it's all about how seeing as the internet and phones and all that jazz mean that we can work like whenever, wherever, we're meant to be together. Seeing as we're armed with all that these days, a lot of us have the potential to like be properly in control of our own working structure and our working lives. The whole kind of like work smarter, not harder, like define your own definition of success, uh, find your own work-life balance, that type of vibe. Honestly, I'm mainly just hoping it's gonna motivate me to find a balance that's a bit better between work and life because let me tell you, I find it really hard to switch work off and stop worrying about it. Basically, I just worry constantly about all of this internet thing. It might be a load of nonsense or it might be helpful and full of really good advice. I have no idea yet, but I'll probably report back on Instagram stories probably. Um, I'm at Lucy Jane Wood if you want to have a follow and I'll let you know how I get on with it over there. Anyway, I already feel well grown up for buying a business book, so well done me professional. So I think that's 10. I, I mean, I, I vaguely think that's 10. And after chatting about all them, there must have been a few because I genuinely feel like my voice has gone a bit husky. <laughs> I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I have been meaning to sit down and do this one for such a long time. I love making these videos. I find them so fun to like sit and think about and film and decide what books I want to include. I cannot wait to have a chat with you guys in the comments about all of this. I want to hear what you've been reading recently. If you've got any recommendations for me, have you read any of these for yourself? Did you agree or disagree with what I was thinking about them? Um, I would love to have a little chat with you about all things bookish. So let's get involved in the comments down below and we can have a good natter. If you did enjoy this one, then please don't forget to give it a little thumbs up and don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. If you're new, if you fancy sticking around that would be lovely don't forget you can also follow me on twitter and instagram both at lucy jane wood and i will see you guys very soon with another video bye Mwah.